Yeah, I saw the Batman. It was awesome. Want to hear a knock-knock joke? All right, knock-knock. You're supposed to say who's there. <laughs> oh, did I tell you that joke already? Oh, hey, Mini Crawler. I was wondering if you wanted to... to... <laughs> Oh, what stinks? The smell started when you came in. Well, that wasn't very... Well, yeah, I could see that being a thing. So, do you want to be in today's video? No, I prefer to sleep. Hello? Hello? Enjoy the video. Hello. You probably don't remember me, nor did I really expect you to. We met once, about six months ago. Yeah, that sounds about right. It's been about six months by now. I was renting out a room in my building, as I am the manager. A lot of people responded to my ad in the local newspaper, but you were the person I selected. You were, after all, the prettiest girl I've ever seen. You have the most perfect long hair. And those eyes, God, those eyes could light up a room. I selected you the moment you walked in to view the apartment, even though you hadn't yet signed the lease. I knew you would, though. When you asked me how much, I gave you half the price everyone else in the building would be paying. No need to thank me. I didn't do it for you. I did it for myself. I needed you to stay. So, here's where things get interesting. As the building manager, I have keys to all the apartments. That's right. That includes 7B. I've been in your apartment so many times that I think I've lost count. I started sneaking in every day when you would head off to class, and then to your part-time job. At first, I was just snooping around, trying to find out if you had a boyfriend. Then I got too nervous for that. I couldn't just ask you out. You would have surely said no. I enjoyed smelling your clothes more than anything else. You have such a wonderful smell to you. It's almost floral, really. But I think you just bought that perfume from some department store. I know a million girls are probably wearing it by now, but you wear it the best. Yes, you do. My favorite drawer in the house was always that top one. You know? The one where you keep your underwear. I like to put them on sometimes. I put them on and stand in front of that big mirror on the closet door, brushing my hair with your hairbrush. That way I can smell just like you for the rest of the day. Then there was that week where you got the flu. I waited all morning for you to leave your apartment, and unfortunately you didn't leave that day. Or the next day, or even the day after that. I began to panic. As soon as you left again, I rushed right in. I had a plan this time, you see. I wouldn't be away from you for that long ever again. I couldn't risk it. So, I'm a really smart guy. I know a lot about cameras. All kinds of cameras, really. There's the one above your bed, a few in your living room, and even a few behind the mirrors, which of course I replace so I can see right through them. I even have a few waterproof ones in the places you would least expect them to be. There's one in the drain of your shower, and my favorite, the one in your shower head. I feel like I'm there with you, watching you wash your hair and sing some songs you probably heard on the radio. It makes me feel so big, looking down at you as you go about cleaning yourself. I like it when you clean yourself the best. You know what the best part about having all these cameras is? Well, I'll give you a hint. I can see everything you're doing all the time. Unfortunately, that can't be the case anymore. I got your paperwork and you broke my heart. You want to leave? After all we've been through? Well, I can't let that happen. No, I can't. Obviously, I've got a plan for that too. 
You see, I'm watching you read this right now. You always take a shower when you get home from work, and I know that. So I left this note right on your mirror, where you can read it, and I can watch you read it. There's something that makes this time a bit different, but I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, it is the best part. I promise, well worth the wait. I can't let you leave. I love you, you know. You're my best friend. My bestest, best friend ever. I know all of your secrets. I know where you keep all those secret things you don't want anyone to see. And I know how you fall asleep on the couch every night watching sitcoms. We're close, you and I. We can be great together. I know you love me too. And if you don't, well, we'll work on that later. Now, as I was saying, the best part of this is that I don't have to watch you from my apartment, which I've moved to 7C. That's right. I've been right next door for months. I couldn't be on the bottom floor and have you all the way up here alone. You might get scared at night if I wasn't so close by. So now that you know, here I am, out in the open. Go ahead. Look behind you. Hey guys, I had such a good time at the Met Gala and I couldn't decide what I wanted to wear. I wanted it to be unique and different where everyone would look at me. First, I tried on the skin of a construction worker, but that just didn't suit me. The skin was rough and from all the years of hard work, it lingered on to me when I was wearing his skin. So I threw it away and I was still positive though that I was going to find something. I was super excited about the Met Gala, and it would be such a good day to get away from normal people. Then I tried on the skin of an office worker, who was just a little overweight, and I was also going to write on his skin, I am skinny, even though his office worker's skin was really overstretched. I was super excited about this, and I couldn't wait to turn up at the Met Gala showing up in an overweight office worker's skin. It would have made all of the models and A-list celebrities all turn towards me, but at the last moment, I decided not to. Something inside of me said, go further. So I did. I then tried on the skin of someone suffering from cancer. And this felt like even more unique. Going to the Met Gala is all about uniqueness and being different. And at the same time, I'll be showing awareness to cancer. I could feel the suffering of the cancer patient and it became too much for me. I didn't think I could handle wearing the skin of the cancer patient for too long. I gave the cancer patient his skin back. He was upset, but I thought I made the right decision. Then it finally hit me, and I took off my own skin, and then wore it again. So I wore my own skin to the Met Gala. How deep is that? I'm a genius. The Met Gala was amazing. I'm a barber. And I suppose I can say I've been one for as long as I can remember. That would be about 25 years now. I worked in a small town on the New Mexican border and had a small selection of regular customers, all of which were either the war veterans who came back home after the Second World War or they were workmen coming in for their weekly trim. I'll never forget the night Bill Nielsen decided to come in just at closing time. He was a small old man, probably in his late 80s, but he was one of my best customers. Sometimes Bill and I would just talk about whatever came to mind. My wife, my grandchildren, or even the way he won a medal back in Japan. He wore that medal every time I saw him. It was his pride and joy. He always had it pinned onto his suit jacket, and every so often I would catch him shining it with his neckerchief. God, did he love that medal. As I was just sweeping up the last of the hair, the bell on the door rang and old Mr. Nielsen walked on in. He wore a big smile on his face. Evening, Tommy. Hello, Mr. Nielsen, I laughed. That man always brightened up a room when he walked in. You're late. Yes, yes, he said, struggling to hop up into the chair. I've got somewhere special to be tonight, Tommy. 
Can you give me the best haircut you've got? I'll try my damnedest, I assured him, putting the cape on him so as not to mess up his suit. So, what's the occasion? He spoke slowly, as if it were difficult for him to get the words to come out. Well, Tommy, it looks like I'm going to be seeing some family I've not seen in, well, 40 years. That's fantastic, I laughed, patting him on the shoulder and trimming the sides a bit. I never cut his hair too much, as I knew it would take a while to grow back completely. He didn't have much hair, but pretending that I was cutting a lot off brought him a feeling of joy I can't even describe to you. I think it made him feel young again. I finished his haircut and decided that I wasn't going to charge him for it. I'd made enough to get by for the week, and I really didn't need this old man's money. He reached for his wallet, but I put up my hand to refuse. Nah, Mr. Nielsen, this one's on me, I said. Have fun at that family reunion. Mr. Nielsen smiled at me and put his hand on my shoulder. You were always such a good boy, Tommy. Here. He started taking off his pin and he handed it to me quickly. Before I could object, he was out the door. I stared at the pin for a long moment and put it in my pocket. Just as I was closing up, my cell phone rang. Hello? Oh, Tommy, I'm so glad you answered, my mother said quickly. I'm sure by now you've heard about Mr. Nielsen. What about him? I asked. He died two nights ago, Tommy, my mother said solemnly. His wake is tonight, and... Ma, you must be mistaken, I said, feeling my blood run cold. I just gave him a haircut. He said he was having a family reunion. My mother was silent for a moment before saying, I think we need to have a talk. Come meet me at the house and we'll talk about it. I did end up attending Mr. Nielsen's wake that evening. When I saw him in his suit, my body seemed to give out on me. I saw him laying in a casket, without the pin that he always wore. That was still in my pocket. Stroke my ego, you unimportant thing, and do it in such a way that it makes me feel that I am something completely new. Stroke my ego so much that even when the universe eventually dies, it will not affect me, and the abyss will be too scared to stare back at me. Stroke my ego, you lesser being, and keep stroking it, even when your body is too tired, or starving, and even when you're ill, keep stroking my ego. And I don't care about your children being eaten by some monstrous human. I don't care that you're bound for hell. And all I care is that you keep stroking my ego. Don't just stroke at my ego, but now you must scratch at my ego. Let there be a little pain and friction. Come on, dig deep and think about all the times your children dragged you into the forest and forced you to become possessed by the spirits of the forest and you then become lost for days. Think about all the times faces appear in your walls, wrecking your own home and eating everything. So scratch at my ego now. And don't just stroke it, because my ego now needs more, much more and more. Don't just scratch at my ego, but now you must belt it with a baseball bat and even whip my ego. Show it some energy. And to help you put some force into it, think about all the times you thought your life was going good but then you find a rope coming from your ceiling, and as you tug on it, it brings out the quicksand into your proper horrid life. So think about all of that and whip my ego and beat it with a stick because stroking it won't do anymore. Keep showing my ego more attention with an edge to it. Don't just beat my ego with a bat or a whip, but now you must bite at my ego and have a taste of my ego. Simply stroking it won't do anymore. And you can practice biting into my ego by first biting into other people with large egos. Don't just stroke my ego because I need more now and you can even scream at my ego. Then after all of that, I want you to then destroy my ego and destroy it completely. I want you to destroy it so much that my body starts to have a bad reaction to it and I become a humanoid creature of no origin. And then you can kill me. Then. My ego will grow again, and I will resurrect myself with my newfound ego. And the whole process 
We'll start again. Everyone has a secret desire that most people never know how to express. Whether or not they realize it, everyone wants to tell a story. Everyone secretly wishes they could be a writer. To have that control over the lives of others, fictional or not, is something everyone has always dreamed of. To make your perfect couple fall in love and to kill off a symbol of your greatest enemy is to truly live through your characters. It's the greatest gift of all, having the ability to express those thoughts on paper. I started burning my books in December of 2004. It seems harsh, but as an unpublished author, it isn't as though my work might be missed. The reasoning is what got me here, to where I am today. I don't have much time, but I would like to tell you my story. It's a bit strange. This is the first time I've ever written a true story. Of course, no one believes me, but I do hope that someday, perhaps if I am lucky, someone might find this and learn from it. It's far too late for me. I loved romance. I spent endless hours writing about the woman that I loved. Callie was her name. However, whenever I wrote about us in my work, her names would vary. I could never find that perfect name to express her quite the way her real name did. Thousands of pages were filled with romantic picnics and sleepless nights, all based on true events. Though rejected for publication hundreds of times over, I wasn't quite bothered by it. I felt as though our story could be passed down to our grandchildren someday. When I walked in on her with my brother, the love story collapsed. I spent hours, days, weeks, months, up all night and trying to piece together my story. I was more concerned with the book than Callie herself. I felt as though if I expressed my character's pain in the right way, it would fix itself somewhere along the line. I wrote several different scenarios, none of which were to my liking. In one case, my character forgave hers, but that wasn't right. That would never happen. In another segment, my character simply broke off the relationship and found a new love. That was also impossible, seeing as I had definitely put all my eggs into one basket with this one. I finally came to the perfect story and solution to my problem. My character would simply kill her character. Yes, that was the perfect plan. After spending days writing different deaths for Callie and the person she once was, my character tied Callie to her bed while she was sleeping and cut her face off, allowing her to bleed to death. I do believe she choked on her own blood before she could bleed out, but that is up for debate. Before I knew it, I woke up here, in this white room with this jacket on. They keep me medicated often, but I think that's because I'm having a hard time adjusting. I don't really believe the story they're telling me about how I got here in the first place. They keep saying I killed Callie, but I know for a fact that can't be true. As I write this, I know for a fact I didn't act on that. But then again, I wonder sometimes if they might be telling me the truth. You see, sometimes, when you're writing, the lines between reality and fantasy get a bit blurred. I wonder what ever happened to Callie. I know there's a remote possibility she has been dragged a bit too far into my fairy tales, but there's also a chance that I'm being blackmailed. I like to believe that I'm being tricked. And enjoy the free television. Whew! Ugh! Oh, it's finally starting to smell normal in here again. Seriously? Oh, oh, oh god, oh! Oh, oh my teeth are melting! Uh, 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 uh.